So, it is my pleasure to welcome back Dr. Samuel Ramsey. Um, he is um, from the United States. He has a Bachelor of Science in Entomology from Cornell University and has recently completed his PhD from Maryland University. Congratulations, Dr. Ramsey. This follows an enduring interest in entomology that started 22 years ago. His current work focuses on the involvement of the infamous, um, infamous varroa mite and the ongoing issues with honeybee health decline and what has been done to reverse it. He's further turned his sights on studying into a lesser known but apparently more destructive honeybee parasite, which we're gonna hear about today. So please, Dr. Ramsey, come and join me on the stage. Join me in welcoming him as he speaks to us about the AAA labs mites. All right. So, um, I guess at this point, uh, I don't need to do any further uh, introduction. You did a great job in pronouncing that, by the way. Were you practicing? Tropolay laps? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, this is, an odd, this is an odd parasite that I have to talk to you about today. Um, you, some of you were there for my previous presentation uh, where I, I spoke about my research on Varroa destructor. And a lot of people really enjoy the hopeful tone that that presentation has. Uh, and I'm gonna try to maintain a hopeful tone about this one, but if you were to juxtapose these two presentations together, the first one is more the, um, the encouraging, inspirational movie. This one's the horror movie. So just as a preface, just to let you know. Um, today I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, a parasitic organism closely related to Varroa destructor that has not gotten nearly enough attention in my opinion. Behold, Tropolelaps mercedesi. This is a parasite that feeds on honeybees, uh, feeds on the brood, uh, and has a, a very pronounced impact on the colony. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of the tropolelaps mites that appears to be feeding right now on uh, honeybee brood. Um, these images were taken at Chiang Mai University in Thailand, uh, and that should tip you off as to where these organisms currently are. Now, they were originally parasites of the giant honeybee, and therein lies the problem. Uh, the organism that they usually use as a host is much larger than Apis mellifera. As a result of that, what they can feed on uh, in, in uh, Apis dorsata or Apis brevilligula, the giant honeybees, the amount of tissue that they can extract and still leave the host okay uh, is going to be really different from the amount of tissue that they can extract in Apis mellifera and still leave the host okay. And as a result, there is a very unbalanced host-parasite relationship here that very quickly leads to the death of their host honeybees. Uh, they are currently found in more than just Southeast Asia now, and that is where things are getting to be a bit problematic. So a couple of things that I really want to point out to you about this geographic distribution map. Um, these organisms started out in the same area of the world as, a, uh, as a Varroa destructor, so in Southeast Asia, um, and then they began to spread outside of that region, and they've been spreading at the exact same rate that Varroa destructor was not long ago. Um, they're going to the same countries in the same order, which should make everybody just a wee bit nervous. Um, a couple of things to point out here, though, is the oddity that you see here and here. And that one uh, is usually the one that would, I would expect would bother people in New Zealand the most. Closest proximity to you in Tasmania. Uh, there was one specimen of a tropolelapse mite that was identified in Tasmania. And so this paper that was written about it, uh, I think 12 years ago, referenced this. And I was very concerned about the, the possibility that this parasite was already in Australia and moving around uh, in the region. I gave this presentation at uh, the Eastern Apiculture Society meeting. So it's the largest um, apiculture meeting that we have in the US. And there are actually a couple of attendees from New Zealand. Uh, and their response upon hearing this was, no, I don't think that's happening. <laughs> and uh, they were so adamant and confident that there were no tropolelapse mites in Tasmania that I had to go back and track through all of the sources and find that original source from ages ago that cited this. Um, but it was a, let's say, dubious source. Uh, an individual appears to have identified a pollen mite 
as a tropolalapsmite, so it's likely an issue of misidentification. Um, no tropolalapsmites have been found in Tasmania uh, at least in the last 15 years, and as a result, they're going to be updating this map this year uh, and removing Tasmania from the list. But what should concern you also is that um, one was found in Africa. And what researchers have been saying for some time now is a reason why we should not be concerned about this parasite is because it does not do well with long travel because they have to be in the presence of brood in order to survive for anything longer than 36 hours. If they are separated from brood, they starve to death very quickly. So just a population of adult honeybees doesn't seem to be able to sustain them. Uh, and so a lot of people have been saying this parasite won't spread very well. Um, even though it was found uh, in Africa, um, the colonies in which it was found were burned, they were destroyed. Um, hopefully there are no more of them there. None have been seen within 10 years, and so the map will also be updated to, uh, to say that they, have not, uh, they are not currently found in this area. But what this should show is that this organism has a dramatic capacity to spread. Compare that map with Varroa destructor's map of spread, and you'll notice uh, as Varroa first left Southeast Asia, uh, China and Russia were the first places where it became a big concern, and it has now arrived in both of those places. Um, there are concerns now about its spread into the Middle East. And the reason why we should be concerned about its spread into the Middle East is because that's, that was the big jumping off point for Varroa destructor. Uh, within 15 years of arriving in the Middle East, we had Varroa in the U.S. And it wasn't long after that that you guys started seeing them here. Um, so we saw Varroa in the U.S. in 1987. Uh, you guys saw Varroa in New Zealand, I believe, in 2000, correct? So, yeah. So, the ways that these organisms, uh, the way that this organism is spreading leads us to believe that based on the history here, we should be paying more attention to this creature. Case in point, it doesn't take a lot to cause a problem. With parasites like Varroa and Tropolalaps that are already pregnant when they emerge from the cell and don't need to mate a second time, uh, this allows for these organisms to establish a population very easily. Every adult Varroa mite that you see walking around is already pregnant. She doesn't need to mate. There are no barriers to that single Varroa female establishing a new population if you were to move her from one location to the next. It's the same with Tropolalaps. Now, I want you to know just how much damage a single introduction of an organism can do. And for that, I would like to use Reunion Island as uh, sort of a case study here and how quickly things can get pretty crazy. So uh, Reunion Island is an island, uh, it's not very large, it's off the coast of Madagascar, way off the coast of Madagascar. And <clears throat> an interesting thing occurred here. So we're part of the, the co-loss network, uh, and every few years we'll all get together and we'll talk about the losses in our respective regions. Uh, and everybody would be a little bit cranky with Reunion Island, because the rest of us would show up and say, oh, uh, we had a pretty good year this year. We only had 26% losses uh, by the end of the year. We're like, yeah, 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 we're doing good. We're down from 40%. And the Reunion Island people would say, oh, we had a rough year. We had a really rough year this year. Uh, across the entire island, we had 1.6% losses. Okay, all right, no, that's fine, that's fine. You know, you do you, everything is relative, it's fine. But their big thing is that they had no Varroa on this island. Um, and none of the diseases associated with Varroa, uh, the vast majority of the viruses they had never seen on this island, everything was going swimmingly. And I'm sure you can guess that there's a but there. One gentleman, and everybody knows who this guy is, one gentleman introduced Varroa to this island just a couple of years ago, I believe uh, 2017, yeah? Um, and everybody knows the guy, which is probably the most disheartening part of this because he is not a well-liked individual at this point. Um, he had been told multiple times by the bee inspectors on the island, do not import queens. Uh, from Madagascar and from Paris, which are two areas where he really liked to, um, to bring in imports. And he would always say, well, queens don't have Varroa. We don't need to worry about that. Anybody see you there? Queens have attendants. Attendants have Varroa. 
So apparently, uh, the attendants that came in with one of his uh, queen imports uh, introduced into the island on the northern tip um, some varroa mites. We know that it was very, very, very few, probably one or two mites, but they've established a population that has uh, surrounded the periphery of the island and eventually moved inland, and I want you guys to guess what the change in their loss rate was in one year of having varroa. So their average loss rate per year was 0.6%. Where do you think it is hovering now? Guesses? We got a 40% over here and a 60. Oh, a 60. Oh, we've got you. All right, all right. 64%. One year. But because these honeybees were entirely naive to this parasite, first of all, its spread around the island was dramatic. It went around the periphery of the island and then just moved right into the middle really, really quickly. Uh, and now pretty much every colony that you expect in Reunion Island has varroa. And they saw losses that were absolutely unprecedented. This was a cataclysmic <laughs> event for them because they didn't know how to deal with loss rates um, going up that quickly. But this is what it's like when a host is fully naive to a parasite. Uh, as a result of that, that host then has no natural defenses to this organism, uh, and you see a culling in the gene pool of a lot of genetic stock very quickly. This is what we don't want to happen uh, in, in our areas, and the best way for us to avoid these sorts of things is to know your enemy. Now the problem that I've seen, a lot of people ask me, all right, Sammy, why study tropole lapse? In the US, we already have a parasitic mite. It's named Varroa, it's terrible. What we wanna do is dedicate all of our resources and our time and our effort and our energy to studying the thing that we do have here. And when the other one comes along, we'll worry about it then. So uh, they are not here yet, is what I hear the most frequently. Is there a word that stands out to you in that sentence? It's the yet. The yet always concerns me. I actually had a project that was fully funded to, to go to uh, Thailand and study this parasite, uh, and the budget was cut three times until the whole project just uh, ended up having to, to dissolve. Uh, and what I was told at the end of it was, it, we really don't need to worry about this right now. They're not here yet. Come on, you even said yet. You know what I know. It's, on, it's, it's going to happen at some point. We no longer exist in discrete ecosystems. There was a time where you could describe the world based on the Asian ecosystem, the African ecosystem, the South American, North American ecosystems. Uh, that just doesn't work anymore. The rate of international travel has increased to an extent that we just have a global ecosystem. Organisms are being moved around all the time. The rate of spread for Varroa back in the 1980s is going to be fairly different than what it would be now with international travel having ramped up the way that it has. So we may be seeing these organisms more quickly than we thought. And what I'm concerned about is that there is a waiting attitude to it. Yeah, it'll arrive, but we will study it when it shows up. The problems there, one, when it shows up, if you do not already have an understanding of this organism in place, it is very easy for you to just end up running around in circles, scrambling, um, trying a bunch of things that are ineffective and inefficient, and in that time, that parasite can then spread all around uh, and establish itself in a way that makes it almost impossible to remove at that point. If you already have ideas in place as to what would be effective at eradicating this organism and how best uh, to manage the issues that it brings to your bees, it is a lot easier for you to rectify that problem in a way that is more permanent. In addition to that, when we try a wait and see attitude, oftentimes we have to rely on, uh, we have to rely on research um, that we are not always going to be privy to all of the details of. We've been saying that Varroa destructor feeds on the bee's blood for more than half a century because there was a paper written about this in a language that we couldn't read a long, long time ago. And when they finally got to the US, we had conducted almost nothing in the way of study of this organism ourselves. And so we had to base the work that we wanted to do on papers that we couldn't read. Now, people tell me now that wouldn't be a problem. We have Google Translate now. Really, guys? Really? True story. 
I wanted to show you guys just how bad Google Translate is at translating um, tonal languages, so specifically Chinese, Vietnamese, Thai, uh, the languages that a lot of these papers are being written in now. Um, and I wanted to show you how bad it is at translating scientific text into other languages. So I took a block of text from a paper written in Thai, uh, and then I put it into Google Translate. There were so many F-bombs that arose uh, in that translation that I could not legitimately put it in a professional presentation. But just know, um, it is not an accurate way for you to move about this world expecting that Google Translate will allow you uh, to get through uh, these sorts of matters. It's just not going to work. So what we really need are papers to be published um, by the standards that we approve of as best practices uh, and in languages that are more easily accessible um, to the Western world so that we are aware of what's going on uh, and are able to capitalize on that work as we go forward. Uh, another question that I get pretty frequently is, well, how will we do that? Those organisms are in Southeast Asia, and now they're in some other parts of the world as well, but they're primarily in Southeast Asia, uh, and it's difficult to study those creatures there. Uh, it's they're difficult to study if you don't speak an Asian language. I agree, they can be kind of difficult to study if you don't uh, speak the language. And uh, another case in point matter, you know I like telling stories, so here's a funny story. Um, the work that I conducted on Varroa actually attracted the attention of a set of researchers in Thailand. Um, that set of researchers asked me if I would be interested in coming to Thailand uh, to conduct a similar study on tropolalaps. What they said is, um, your student, oh, they were telling my advisor this, so my advisor, Dennis Van Engelstorp at the time, uh, they said, you know, your student, his work shows that the Varroa mites are not feeding on what we thought they were feeding on. Do you think he might be willing to try the same thing with the tropolalaps mites? Because we have been saying for quite some time now that tropolalaps feed on the bee's blood because they're similar to Varroa, and Varroa feed on the bee's blood. But we never really tested it. Mmm, okay, all right. Um, and so do you think that your student might be willing to come to Thailand for a few months and study this parasite here? And my advisor says, do I think that my student might want to go off to a tropical paradise for a few months to study a different parasite? Yeah, I'll ask him. Uh, and she says, well, well hold, hold, hold on there, hold on there. Things might get to be a little bit difficult uh, along this process. He might not be able to come as soon as you're thinking uh, because if he doesn't know Thai, it can be difficult to get around uh, in some of these areas uh, and especially in the regions where there are a lot of bees, um, there's not a lot of English speaking individuals there. Um, so that barrier, that language barrier might take a while to get over. Um, and uh, my advisor said, you know what? That actually might not be a, as big a problem as you think. And then he sent her this weird video. That's my jam. Yes. You, oh. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, this is a little bit odd, but in my free time, I film videos singing in Thai and post them online uh, under the stage name Black Thai. Yeah, yeah, you heard that right. So, <laughs> um, this is odd, and I'm aware that this is odd. I am a very nerdy individual. Um, I really cannot explain to you in terms that will be satisfying how this became a thing. All I can say is that I was really bored the second year, my second year of graduate school. I was working on a project that was not about bees yet. I was working on a, a project studying stink bugs uh, and I was not excited about what I was doing. As a result of this, um, when I was in the lab studying stink bug behavior and filming the stink bugs uh, interacting, I would play movies uh, and just kind of let them play in the background and I got tired of all the American movies. I could always predict the endings. So YouTube started recommending to me movies from other countries, and I fell in love with the Thai movies. I loved the, the, the language and the music that was attached to them and the weird uh, progression of different storylines. And I thought to myself, I don't know another language. 
everybody should know at least two languages. Um, but since the U.S. is such a big landmass and you can pretty much go anywhere and speak English, uh, a lot of Americans don't have to learn another language. And I decided I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to learn Thai because I'm a singer. I love singing and this language is tonal and it's really pretty. And I had no idea that it would ever be useful under any circumstance. <laughs> But turns out it was a pretty good idea, right? <laughs> so I feel like I am uniquely positioned at this point to conduct a study on the Tropole lapse mites um, because I can take the knowledge that I have from my work on Varroa. Uh, I can also take my comfort with Thai language and Thai culture uh, and study this organism in an area where uh, it is found pretty heavily and pretty extensively. So all of that to say, Tropolelaps is an emerging threat to beekeeping around the world, and we need to better understand this organism. So I would like to detail to you the study, uh, the, the, um, the work that I've been thinking through, proposing, and planning to do. Um, what we need to know about this organism, what we don't know about this organism, and what we are doing about our lack of knowledge. So. Tropolelaps exists in four different species. Tropolelaps is the genus, um, but we know that there are at least four species of this organism. There's Tropolelaps clarii, Tropolelaps mercedesi, Tropolelaps coenigerum, and Tropolelaps tai. Not very easy to pronounce, but I want you guys to be able to leave here today and go and tell people what you have learned. So say it with me, Tropolelaps. You got it, all right, Tropolelaps. So you don't need to remember uh, the third or fourth uh, of the ones uh, listed here because it's the first and second that are the most concerning. These are the only two species that have actually made a transition to Apis mellifera. Now, Varroa also has four species. Only one species of Varroa has ever been found on Apis mellifera, and that's Varroa destructor. However, two Tropolelap species have decided to transition from their giant honeybee counterparts down to Apis mellifera, and that is deeply concerning. Part of it is because uh, the giant honeybees in Southeast Asia uh, and Apis mellifera are often put together in the same areas for long periods of time where they can exchange parasites with each other, and that seems to have pre precipitated uh, this transition. Of course, with Tropolelaps being a parasite of the giant honeybees, there are ways that they have had to adapt their own parasitic behavior to this op from this open nesting species to this cavity nesting species. And they have done a spectacular job of it. Uh, and now are found more frequently in Apis mellifera colonies than they were ever found in their original host, which is frightening. Now, so let's talk a bit about the life cycle. There's a fair bit of similarity with Varroa destructor a lot of people draw comparisons between the two organisms, specifically because the life cycle is very similar. You will find a phase of this organism on adult bees, um, which is usually termed the phoretic phase. Um, you may know from my presentation yesterday that in some circumstances that term is not accurate. It is not accurate for Varroa destructor. It has not been tested as to whether tropolelaps actually feed on adult bees or not. The fact that if you keep Tropolelaps with only adult bees, the fact that they don't survive for more than um, about 36 hours, leads us to believe that they're not able to derive sustenance from adult bees. But that needs to be tested first before we can officially call this, this phase a phoretic phase. It's also interesting because a phoretic phase is a time where you're going to use an organism as a vehicle to take you from one location to the other. And that takes some time, especially considering there are certain hosts uh, like nurse bees that are not going to spend a lot of time flying around outside the colony. Now, Varroa destructor spends on average seven days on an adult bee during its phase on the adult bee population. Um, but between three and 13 are the, the limits on there. Now, how long do you think Tropolelaps spends on adult bees? I'll give you a hint. It's less than Varroa, substantially. So somewhere less than seven days, what are you thinking? Three days, one day, no, less than one day actually, usually about 12 hours. Why is that concerning? It's concerning because beekeepers have been trying to adapt different treatments that have been used on Varroa destructor 
four triple elaps and have been wondering why aren't these working? Or how come they only work for a few months and then it doesn't do anything to the parasites anymore? My hypothesis is that because this parasite spends so little time on adult bees, and because the vast majority of the treatment measures that we have for Varroa destructor only affect the population on the adult bees, what is happening is that we're exposing this parasite to sublethal levels of a toxin. It's not being exposed long enough to kill it, but just long enough for it to taste that poison, develop a resistance to it, and pass that on to its offspring. That is concerning. The genome for this organism has been sequenced, and what we have found is that they have a ridiculous number of genes dedicated to detoxifying pesticides and developing resistance to them, far higher than Varroa destructor, and it allows them to develop resistance very quickly, uh, and that is a big concern. And as we continue exposing them to these same Varroa treatments without modifying the system, uh, we are destroying a set of tools that we might have been able to use in the future if we had changed a few things uh, about how we were employing them. So I'm hoping that we can slow that process down, find out what is an effective way to treat this organism, uh, and then start focusing our attention there. Now, after that phase on the adult bees that for now uh, tentatively we'll call a phoretic phase, um, they then invade cells. Um, they will invade cells a little bit earlier than Varroa destructor, usually about 10 hours before capping, Varroa will invade cells. You can find them up to a day before capping, uh, invading cells in which they will feed uh, on the brood. Uh, they will feed on progressively younger and younger brood if there are no cells that are ready to be capped, uh, and this allows them to sustain themselves um, if the, the population of bees uh, isn't close to capping. A difference between them and Varroa destructor that I find very striking is that you will find both the adult males and adult females outside of the cells. Reproduction occurs in the cell and only in the cell. Uh, the female tropolalapse mite will lay an egg. In Varroa, that first egg is always a male. In tropolalapse, and that's the only egg that will be a male in a healthy Varroa female. She will lay one egg that'll be a male, the rest will be females. Uh, that male will be destined to mate with his sisters. In tropolalapse, they lay about a 50-50 spread here. Uh, the first egg can be male or female, and they just keep laying them back and forth, and everybody leaves the cell. The males in Varroa destructor uh, do not leave the cell. Uh, as soon as it is uncapped, uh, very soon after the male dies, uh, air, uh, the movement of air back and forth causes the water to evaporate out of his body, and the male dies. In tropolalapse, they all emerge from the cell and continue their business. Why is that important? Yes, they can mate with someone that they are not related to. Varroa destructor, there is a, uh, a slowdown to the progression of evolution in their genome because of inbreeding. Uh, you, the vast majority of the time, will not have the opportunity to mate with any individual that you are not related to. Tropolalapse, however, when the males leave the cell, they run around on the frame and find females that they are not related to, to then mate with. And that is also problematic. There is also a dramatic difference in size between these organisms that makes it difficult to see tropolalaps, at least when they're standing still. They're about a third the width of Varroa destructor and every bit as long. However, when they're moving, it's not as difficult to pick them out. Anybody see anything weird on that, uh, that frame? Yeah, this video haunted my nightmares for a little bit. Before I got to Thailand, uh, Dr. Lilia de Guzman uh, showed me this video that she had captured while she was there because I'm not the only one sounding the alarm about this creature. Uh, Dr. Jeff Pettis and Dr. Lilia de Guzman uh, have also tried to get people more interested in figuring this creature out before it uh, arrives. And uh, what we've found are a few interesting differences. They are smaller than Varroa. They are also substantially faster than Varroa. Because of the distribution of legs in Varroa, they've got all of their legs bunched up in the front of their body and then all of that shell around the back, it makes them really bumbly. It makes it very difficult for them to move forward in any reasonable way. But because Tropolalapse's legs are distributed across their body in a way that allows them to, to dart around pretty quickly, they're really good at it. They also have a distinct preference for where they like to hang out on adult bees. Notice, uh, this graph probably looks a bit familiar to you. Um, I recycled the same data, set, or data sheet uh, that I used when looking at where Varroa destructor prefers to be on adult bees. 
In tropolelaps, they very strongly prefer to be in this region between the thorax and the abdomen. And it's a great place to hang out because it is incredibly difficult to groom them off when they're in that region. It's like the small of your back. When you need somebody to scratch that region of your back that you just can't get to, that's exactly the place uh, in honeybees where tropolelaps really love to hang out. That is concerning for a couple of reasons. There was a study conducted uh, by a set of researchers in Thailand where they compared the ability of different honeybee species to remove tropolelaps mites. So they took some giant honeybees, uh, Apis serrana, so the Asian honeybee, uh, very closely related to Apis mellifera, uh, Apis mellifera, and then Apis floria, tiny, tiny, tiny little honeybees. Anybody want to guess uh, who ranked dead last at their ability to remove these parasites? Yeah, it looks like you got it already from that sad look on your faces. <laughs> Apis mellifera is terrible at getting rid of parasites. Now, that might be shocking to you guys. Why is it that we took Apis mellifera and moved it all around the world if it's lacking pretty much all of the genes necessary to control parasites? Well, Apis mellifera struck out on its own. It found a region of the world where it didn't have to compete with other honeybees. All of the honeybee species that exist, exist in Southeast Asia. Uh, there are about 11 species of honeybees, maybe 10 depending on who you ask. Some people group uh, the giant honeybees all together. Um, all of them exist in Southeast Asia. You can find pretty much every one of those species in Thailand. Uh, and those bees get tired of competing with each other for the same sets of resources. Apis mellifera was the only one that decided to strike out on its own. Went off to Europe where there were no parasites coming after it for the most part. And so a lot of those genes that were associated with that were removed from its gene pool. And that allowed for this creature to thrive in a number of ways until we brought it back into an area where there were tons of parasites and allowed them to be exposed again. Now, every time one of those parasites sees Apis mellifera, it sees a free meal. Because those other bees that I was telling you about, the giant honeybees, uh, Apis serrana and Apis floria, uh, all of those species are remarkable at getting rid of parasites. And they have to be, because they exist in a context where parasitism is ubiquitous. Something that I observed there that I thought was the coolest thing in the world. We talk about honeybee dance languages, right? You know, you got the waggle dance and the round dance, and it's, it's really, really cool the way that they can use the angle of the sun and by dancing tell you where to find flowers. There is another dance language that I really wish that Apis mellifera had that it does not have. There is a dance that I saw the other bees perform when they had a parasite on them that elicited the rest of the bees in the colony to groom them. It is the same matter of, I can't scratch this area of my back, but you can. The bees have learned uh, through evolutionary time that they can't get rid of this parasite on their own, but their friends can. And so they do this weird strafing dance where they'll literally tip themselves over to just three legs uh, on one side of their body and just rub up against their neighbors in this weird strafing motion. And it elicits everybody in their vicinity to think, you know what, something is desperately wrong with you and we're gonna jump on you and we're gonna figure this thing out together, all right? Okay? And they just comb the other bee's body until they find the foreign object that's eliciting this behavior. They remove it and they bite it, bite it in half. So you, not, you don't just have them removing the parasite and allowing it to run away. You remove that organism from the gene pool. Apis mellifera does not have this going on, unfortunately. Now, look at the difference in where you see Tropolelaps mercedesi and where you see Varroa destructor. This also leads me to believe that it's very possible that Tropolelaps are not feeding on the adult bee population. Because the reason why you see Varroa destructor between these plates is because there's a very thin membrane called the intersegmental membrane that is very easy to pierce, uh, and right under that membrane is the fat body tissue. And that's a really great source of nutrients for you to access. Tropolelaps, because of the shape of its body, it's shaped like a pill, unlike the flattened uh, sort of concave surface that you get with Varroa, Varroa's body is specifically designed to push those plates up and allow them to exist under them. Tropolelaps does not have that shape, and as a result, they're not able to get in between those plates and access that membrane. So it's very possible that they can only feed on the brood. 
So this is what beekeeping looks like in uh, a lot of areas of Southeast Asia, specifically in Thailand. Uh, I did go to Chiang Mai to conduct three months of research uh, as a doctoral student, and I enjoyed it quite a bit. Uh, and something that you see rather frequently, actually, I shouldn't say rather frequently, exclusively, is that every colony is a single boxer. You will not find uh, multiple boxes stacked on top of each other as you see in uh, just ubiquitously uh, in most beekeeping operations. And one of the reasons for this, the primary reason for this, is because in order to control these parasites without any usage of chemicals, and it's not because they are uh, chemical-free beekeepers, it's because the chemicals are very expensive uh, and the Thai bot is not very strong economically. Uh, and so their way of treating this matter is to just do constant walkaway splits, constant walkaway splits. Um, so you have a queen who is desperately ready to lay eggs. Uh, she'll fill up the whole frame. And as soon as you have that box uh, filled up, you um, just split it in half and start another colony and uh, let them make their own queen. And the brood break in this cycle uh, is what allows for you to get rid of the parasites because they cannot exist apart from the brood as best we understand it right now. Uh, and so this allows them to get past things, but it is murder on honey production. It makes things very, very, very difficult in a lot of ways to maintain colonies uh, that are very economically viable. But you get a really pretty brood pattern for a while. Now, you will start to see very quickly, and there's a reason why they do it this way, you will start to see very quickly when you have a problem. Because the very first sign that you have tropole laps in your colony is a very strange, irregular brood pattern where you'll start to see bald brood. A bunch of uncapped cells with pupae just kind of sticking out. When you start seeing this, you know, okay, we've got some tropole laps. In a few weeks, we're gonna to need to do something about this um, because it doesn't take long for the tropole laps to overwhelm the colony. What I told you earlier, that the tropole laps mites only exist on the adult population for about 12 hours, uh, between 12 and 24 hours, that should be concerning because that allows them to have a much faster reproductive rate than you will ever see in Varroa. Varroa spends a whole period of time, close to two weeks, uh, one to two weeks uh, in most instances, where it is not doing any reproducing. There is a reprieve from reproduction uh, for at least a week. However, with tropole laps, there is a reprieve for just 12 hours, and they jump right back into the cells and start this process again. So even though uh, the numbers for how long it takes their, their eggs to develop uh, into adults are fairly similar to Varroa destructor, their reproductive rate is substantially faster, and they can overwhelm a colony so much more quickly. Uh, with Varroa, uh, a lot of colonies can exist for a year, uh, sometimes two years with an infestation of Varroa before they finally succumb to it and die. How long do you think it takes for tropole laps to kill a colony? It's a matter of months, and not many. Usually in about uh, three to five months of being infested with tropole laps, that's the end of that colony. So concerns, deep concerns. This is what the beginning of the end looks like. Uh, if you have not already done something about the tropole laps inside of your colony by the time you start to see the chewed down brood that is rotting, there's not much more that you can do at this point. Um, the bees have had to run around and uncap so many cells in an attempt to get rid of the tropole laps in those cells. Mind you, when they uncap the cells, they don't, they're not quick enough to grab the tropole laps and kill it. So even though they've uncapped the cell, that mite has already had enough time to reproduce and have at least one offspring. And all you've done is uncap the cell early so that that female who was the foundress and that baby um, who has now grown into an adult can then go and establish new, uh, new infestations. Um, and then the bees will go around and uncap so many cells that they don't have enough time to chew down the brood before it begins to rot. And so you'll see this half chewed down brood throughout the colony, uh, which is pretty disturbing. So this is what beekeeping looks like in this region, just whole fields of, uh, of these colonies that they're constantly splitting. Um, Varroa destructor transmits viruses to bees, a lot of viruses to bees. Tropolelaps seems to be able to do exactly the same thing. 
Now, we know that there are at least eight viruses that are directly vectored by Varroa, uh, and there are 13 others that we suspect that they are able to vector. With Tropole Labs, right now, only two. So that's some good news, but I will say there's good news and bad news. We have only tested two, so it's very possible that there's more. Uh, hopefully more testing will be done on this soon, but right now we know for sure that they are able to vector black queen cell virus and deformed wing virus. This is a honeybee that was fed on by Tropole Labs beneath the capping, and you can see very clear symptoms of deformed wing virus in this bee. Um, the mouth parts of the mite, though, are definitely something that you should pay close attention to because these mites, they feed very differently than Varroa does. Varroa is a pretty polite feeder in a number of ways. They will stick their mouth parts uh, into the host, release a, a bit of digestive enzyme, but the hole that they make is very small, and all of the babies, everybody inside of that cell will all feed through that same hole with Varroa destructor. However, with Tropole Labs, they chew their way into the host uh, with these very dramatic uh, ketodactyl sort of mouth parts um, that look like piranha mouths. Uh, have any of you seen the movie Alien? Is that, is that a thing around here? Yeah? Um, I, so that movie is actually based on the parasitic lifestyle of the ichneumonid wasp. So those chest bursters are like what the baby wasps do to caterpillars. But there's another aspect of that movie that mimics science. And it's the part where you see the, the really creepy alien and it sticks that thing out of its mouth that has another mouth on it. You seen that part? Tropole Labs does that. It's, it's concerning. They have this thing that looks like their mouth that's called a camera stone on the front of their face. And then their actual mouth comes out of it. It's like, nah, nah. It's really concerning to see. Um, that's, that's an exact quote, by the way. Okay, so uh, it's deeply concerning to see, uh, and this is what allows them to do so much damage in absence of any viruses. Um, notice, Varroa will feed through one hole. All of those blue spots that you see, those are all different feeding wounds from the same Tropole Laps mite feeding on that brood. Every time they feed, they chew a new hole and every new hole that they chew, there's a level of scar tissue that develops around it, uh, and whatever was going to grow in that region is going to be deformed as a result of that. Those are feeding wounds on the antenna of a bee. So pretty normal looking antenna right now. That's what the antenna looks like when the bee emerges as an adult. It's permanently kinked, and that region of the antenna will not be able to move after that. It's a lot worse when they feed on a region that's destined to become a leg, because then the bee can never actually bend that leg at any of the joints of articulation. Uh, and so you'll see bees walking around the colony with a leg that they can't put down, or a couple, or several. So they can cause lifelong injuries from their feeding in absence of any viruses. I'm going to go through this last part pretty quickly. Um, something that I've really wanted to see. I've really wanted to see more research published about this organism in English uh, and in easily accessible open access journals. Um, and thankfully, I can say that there are some researchers who are working on that. So there's Panawan Chantawanakun, Kirifong Konfini Bunjong, Pacharin Fokasm, and some guy with a really weird name. Is that Samuel Ramsey? Weird. Anyway, uh, these researchers uh, are very intent on conducting research about Tropole Labs and publishing that information in open access journals where you will not have a paywall between you and that information uh, and where it's present in English. And so we're working on that initiative now. Um, I'm exactly not going to go back through this part because I do want there to be time for uh, question and answer, but what I, uh, this is just a recapping of what I've already said. Um, but what I will say, though, is that we do have a study in place now where we are attempting to figure out everything that we can about this parasite. So this is a pregnant Tropole lapse from a video that I took uh, when I was in Thailand. And it is difficult uh, to get a lot of this work done. We had to dig colonies out of the ground. Uh, we had to use the, the uh, help of honey hunters to help us hunt down several of these colonies. Uh, and it paid off. We were able to determine a lot of interesting things, but there is only so much that you can learn about an organism in three months. And so I've actually been uh, working very hard to raise funds so that I can return to Thailand and continue this research, because guys, I was working pretty hard in three months. This is not sped up. This is not sped up. This is how hard I had to work 
to answer all the questions I was trying to answer in three months. So my goal was to return to Thailand and to spend a year studying this organism uh, and answering the different questions that we need to answer. So I have um, uh, the, the things that I want to know. I want to understand this life cycle start to finish. Uh, I absolutely need to know, uh, we'll leave that there for now, I absolutely need to know what is an effective chemical means of controlling this organism and what are effective non-chemical means of controlling this organism. How do they spread between colonies? We don't know that either. These parasites are not good at hanging on to adult bees in flight, and so it's very possible they're getting between colonies via other means. I think they're just running along the ground from one colony to the next. So we're going to make some moats around colonies because moats are awesome. And um, so I'm, I'm looking at everything I can with this parasite. Uh, and I've actually been raising funds for this because I told you in the beginning of the presentation my original project was defunded. Um, and I have been able to raise a substantial amount of support through GoFundMe. Um, all right, $13,000 were we actually able to raise. Uh, so that was enough to get me to Thailand. I'm in Thailand now uh, studying this parasite uh, and will be there until June. Uh, but if you guys want to help in this initiative by circulating this GoFundMe page, I would love having your help uh, because I am under the impression that we can genuinely fight the might and win, but we can't do it alone. Uh, I need your help in that process as well. So thank you very much for your time, effort, and energy in listening to this presentation. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha.